Good morning. That was better than Bible class. Still not great, but that's, uh, uh, I've kind of gotten out of the habit of beginning with uh, introductory remarks like, it's good to see you. Uh, I just have gotten in the habit of jumping straight into the sermon, but we have several guests with us today. It's good to see you, and we have a uh, uh, our regular family here, and it's good to see you. Uh, another thing that I've gotten out of the habit of saying is this. If you've got questions about anything we're doing here, please ask, because we love nothing more than an opportunity to be able to open the Bible with you and say, right here, this is why we do that thing and be able to give you a, a, a clear answer as to why we believe what we believe or why we do the things that we do as the people of God. And there's not a person in this room who wouldn't relish that opportunity. So if you've got questions, ask. Uh, we want to be able to open God's Word with you and look at those things. And it could be that when you ask and you go, but what about this verse? It'll be a learning opportunity for us to be able to say, you know what, we hadn't considered that. Uh, our goal is to do what is right before God and to bring God glory. And if you can help us do that or we can help you do that, uh, it, will be, it will have been a wonderful exchange. So uh, if you've got questions, please um, jump in with them. Uh, we're going to continue on in a series that I've been doing uh, for this year not our regular series, but our backup series, which is what I do on the second Sunday's uh, mornings of every month, which is this Why Should I Believe set of sermon. And today we're going to talk about why should I believe despite my doubts. I was thinking about this for a while, and then I happened upon a couple of sermons just in my, my regular, there are certain preachers that I listen to from other parts of the, of the country, and uh, one of them actually did a two-part series on doubt, and I think I'm going to try to wrap it up into one and just take a couple of things that he said that I thought were particularly powerful and combine them with other thoughts that I'd already uh, working on and thinking about and dwelling on. But this idea of our doubts is something that I think sometimes we struggle with. Is it okay to have doubts? Is it okay to wonder? Is it okay to ask questions? Is it okay to come to God unsure? And how do we handle those kind of doubts? And what should be our response uh, when, whenever we are faced with those little moral or, or thought questions that we might have? The truth is, for most of us, and probably I could even say all of us, Doubts exist. It's just part of life. And, and, and that was true even in the first century. Uh, we won't have time to look at all the passages that I have on the screen, but uh, the disciples often misunderstood. And uh, you'll notice here, the long list of passages all come from the Gospel of Mark. Mark seems to, above all the other gospel writers, really emphasize that the apostles did not have it all figured out. The disciples clearly had questions and things that they wondered about. Uh, here in Mark chapter 4 and verse 40, Mark chapter 4 and verse 40, here the, 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 the storm has come up and the, the disciples are in the boat and they're afraid that they're going to die and they, they yell out, Teacher, do you not care that we're going to die? And Jesus gets up and he rebukes the wind and the wave. But I love the way he says it there in verse 40. Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Do you still struggle with believing? Do you still wonder what's going to happen? And that's something that reoccurs for the disciples all the way through the Gospels. I do want to look at this small set of verses here. John chapter 20 and verse 18. John chapter 20, verse 18 and 19. Here you've got Jesus having resurrected from the dead. 
He's come back alive, and the disciples weren't expecting that. That's one of those things that they misunderstood. Although Jesus reiterated through his ministry, I'm going to be delivered over to men, and I'm going to be hung on a cross, and three days later I'm going to rise again, they all heard those statements and went, what in the world is he talking about? What, what, what is this about? Why does he keep saying? And so he comes back from the dead. He's arisen. He's appeared to Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, and this, we, we just sang a song about the appearance of Jesus to Mary Magdalene. She's excited. She runs to the disciples, and she announces to them, I've seen the Lord. And she told them what he said to her. Verse 19, when it was evening, And on the first day of the week, the disciples were gathered together, hear this, with the doors locked because they feared the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. You know, had they understood, had they been people who weren't doubting, they wouldn't have had the doors locked. They would have been out there proclaiming, hey, guess what's going to happen in a couple of days? You just wait and see the very man who was hanging on the cross just a couple of days ago. You're going to see him again. They didn't get that. They didn't understand. And they were scared themselves. They weren't really sure what was going to happen. And then you've got the story of Thomas, who wasn't there that first time that Jesus appeared to the disciples. And it says down, starting in verse 24, Thomas, one of the twelve, not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples were telling him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, if I don't see the mark of the nails in his hand and put my fingers in the mark of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. Do you hear that? We call him Doubt Thomas, but the truth is that was true of all of them the week before. None of them really understood before Jesus appeared. None of them believed. They all were, were distraught, disturbed, and didn't really know exactly what to expect. They weren't sure what they were supposed to believe. If you look back in Luke chapter 24, Luke chapter 24, he tells them in the same appearance where he, he comes to them in the upper room, he says, why are you troubled, he asked them. And why do doubts arise in your heart? Why do doubts arise? Jesus recognized that the disciples, even the very ones who traveled with him day after day after day, they didn't get it. They didn't understand. They didn't just believe because Jesus gave some teaching and they went, I understand, I believe that, there's no problem here. Look with me over in Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. There's a phrase used here. This is after the occurrences we just spoke about. He's appeared to them in the upper room several times. He's had conversations with them. He's met with them beside the lake. They've eaten together. They've had several interactions over the course of 40 days. They know that Jesus is back again. They recognize that Jesus is resurrected. He's told them to meet him in a certain place so that he can ascend to the Father. And that's where we're at in Matthew chapter 28. But look with me here. In verse 16 and 17, the 11 disciples traveled to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed him. When they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. You ever notice that? I mean, here on the occasion when he's ascending back to the Father, they've had several interactions with the risen Lord. They recognize who he is, what he has done, what he has accomplished, and it still says some doubted. They still don't know what to think. They have all the evidence laid out in front of them, and they're still struggling with what does this mean? How does this work? What is Jesus telling us? How, you know, how is this supposed to change me? They worshiped, but they doubted. Peter doubts in the water. Got the storm of the sea, they doubt. Jesus curses the tree, and they go, what world's going on here? We don't understand. They, when they couldn't cast out the demon, Jesus cries out, oh, you of little faith. Why do you still not know? Over and over and over again, people doubt. 
And it's not just the disciples, but you have the story in Mark chapter 6 of Jesus going back to Galilee. They didn't understand. They didn't get it. They didn't accept him as Lord. Over and over and over again, people doubt Jesus. And so I tell you, we're in good company when we struggle. The truth is, doubt is just one of those things that's always present. You cannot know anything 100%. You can't. There is no fact of life that you can believe in 100% of the time. There is no uh, truth about your life, no experience that you have that you cannot have some sort of doubt attached to it because that is just the way the human brain works. Doubt is a necessary part of what we are, and it's a necessary part of reasoning and thinking. It is a necessary part of understanding life. And I'll tell you, and I've used this illustration before many times, uh, even your own mother you believe is your mother, but you don't actually know. And I know that's weird and odd, and we don't think about it in those terms. You know, I am 100% sure that my mom is my mom. Well, that's not true. I'm 99.99999% sure that my mom is my mom because there's always that chance maybe I've been lied to. Maybe I've misunderstood. Maybe documents have been forged. Maybe the pictures had me photoshopped in somehow. Maybe that baby wasn't actually me, because I can't tell. You know, I, I've heard the stories of my childhood. They could have been made up. There is no way for me to know 100% sure that she is my mom. Even if we had a DNA test uh, regarding the accuracy of our genetics, you know what? I don't know how to read it. So I still have to trust somebody smarter than me to tell me that, yes, the evidence points to the fact that she is my mom, but I can't actually know that she's my mom because I can't read it myself or do the test myself. And even if I could, I couldn't be 100% sure that I did the test correctly. I mean, there really is no way for me to have 100% assurance of anything but I can believe it based on evidence. I can believe it based on the proof. I can believe it based on reason. You know, Acts chapter 17 has a passage that we're familiar with, verse 2 and 3 there. As usual, Paul went into the synagogues and on three Sabbath days reasoned with them from the Scriptures and explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and rise again from the dead. Chapter 18, verse 4, he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade both Jews and Greeks. You know, he had to, to take the evidence, the proof, the information that was available, and he had to put it in front of people, and he had to explain, here's why this makes sense. But they still had to decide whether they were going to believe it or not. They were left with making a decision. There was no 100% proof that Jesus was the Messiah. There's no 100% proof that there is a Messiah. We believe it because God said it. We believe it because there's evidence. We believe it because the scriptures have it laid out in a beautiful story. We believe because we choose to believe. Not because there is no chance of not believing. And I bring this up because ultimately that's how belief works. Belief ultimately comes down to a decision you make. Are you going to choose to believe? Or are you going to choose to be contrarian? Those are your choices. You either choose to, I either choose to believe that my mom is my mom, or I can choose to not believe it no matter what the evidence says. I, I can go one way or the other. I can honestly make a good case either way, no matter how unlikely the case that is that my mom isn't my mom. But I still have to make the choice. I still have to choose what I'm going to believe. I still have to choose whether I want to agree with the evidence or not. I still have to choose whether the evidence will be enough for me or not. And so it ultimately comes down to that. Ultimately, there is a mingling of faith 
and doubt that has to work together in order for us to really respond to the gospel call. Look over in Mark chapter 9. There's a story of a man who, who needs his son saved. His son has been possessed by a demon, and it, it's, it's an awful picture. It says, they brought the boy to Jesus. This is down in verse 20. It says, he fell on the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening to him, Jesus asked the father, from childhood. And many times it's thrown him into the fire or water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and save and help us. Can you imagine what it was like living with that son? I mean, when that demon decides to throw the son in the fire, how does the son get out? Somebody had to pull him out. When that demon throws the son into the water, how does he get out? Somebody had to dive in and get him. And according to this father, this has happened over and over and over again. It's been a mess. It's been difficult. He grinds his teeth. He becomes rigid. He can't speak. Uh, it, it, it's just a disaster of a situation. And he brings his ailed son to Jesus and says, Jesus, we need your help. Jesus says, if you can, everything is possible for the one who believes. Immediately, the father of the boy cried out, I do believe. Help my unbelief. That's where we're at. I think probably most of us, if we're really being honest, that. that that's the correct and honest response to faith in Christ. I do believe, help my unbelief. I, I do believe that he is the Christ, but when I doubt, I need help. I do believe that God is in control of the circumstances of my life, but when it seems like life is out of control, God, I need your help to get me through those weak moments. God, I, I do believe that, that you are working all things together for good for those who know the Lord and love him. But when I don't believe it, Lord, help me. But there is a mingling of many times when I do believe and some of the time when I don't believe, and, and they work together because the times when I don't believe cause me to reevaluate and rethink through and re-reason as to why I do believe. And then that brings me back to a greater belief, but then the circumstances of life knock me back down and I'm back to unbelieving. And I've got to rethink through everything and look at the evidence and consider what the scriptures have to say. And then I'm back to believing and then and things get bad again, and then I'm back over here. And I have this back and forth where I do believe, but Lord, help my unbelief. That, that's where sometimes we're at. And that's kind of just how faith works. Every truth is believed by trust. And I know that is a, maybe a, a different way of thinking about it. We like to think of truth in the sense of it is inarguable, it is provable, it is something you cannot question whatsoever. But that's not really how it works. Truth must be chosen if we're going to believe in it. Now, I, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying whether we choose to believe in it changes the truth of something whatsoever. If God says something is true, it is true no matter what my response is to it. But my belief in that truth is still a decision I must make based on the evidence, based on the proof, based on the reasoning of my brain. I've got to interact with that truth and decide, am I going to trust in this thing or not? Am I going to decide that this is truth, or am I going to argue that it is false? I have to wrestle with that. And that's a hard thing to do sometimes. You know, there is nothing at all that we believe in that we don't believe based on some sort of trust or faith. Uh, yeah, I, 
I, I also use this illustration sometimes. You get sick, you go to the doctor. How do you know your doctor's really a doctor? How do you know he's not a quack? I mean, honestly, you don't. Now, you can have all sorts of evidence, like there's a, there's a diploma hanging on the wall, and here, here he or she has a white coat, and they have one of those uh, listening things that I can't say hanging around their neck. And, and, and then not only that, you've, you've got, uh, he's, he's, he or she seems to know what they're talking about. And, and whenever they talk about your body, they know the names of things. And in modern days, they've got a cool app on their phone that allows them to look up the medicines. There's so many now that can't keep them all straight in their head. And they've got a doctor's office, and they've got a secretary out front, and there's a few nurses hanging out there with them. And it seems legit. It seems like this doctor really knows what they're doing, and so I'm going to trust that doctor because the evidence says that doctor is trustworthy. But I've still got to make that decision. And I think this is a really good illustration because I know enough of us who have been to the doctor and we trusted that the doctor knows what they're talking about, but when the doctor finally gives us an answer, we don't actually do anything the doctor says we're supposed to do. Any of you ever been in that boat? Doctor says, you know what, probably the best thing for you is lose 15 pounds. <laughs> That's not going to happen. I like my nightly bowl of ice cream too much. Or the doctor says, here's a prescription, you need to take it. We go pay for it, but then it sits on our counter and we don't ever take it. If we're asked why we don't take it, it's because, well, I don't like this about it, or I don't like this side effect, or I don't want to get addicted, or I don't want this, or I don't want that. And so while we believe the doctor is a doctor, we don't actually trust what the doctor says we're supposed to do. I think sometimes that's how faith works. Yes, we believe God is God, but are we actually going to do what God says we're supposed to do? Or are we more concerned about how the side effects affect us than we are about actually doing what the, the good, great physician says we're supposed to do? I think sometimes we struggle with that, that there's this mingling between what we know, what we believe, what we are assured of, and then what we don't like or what we're not sure about. And so we struggle sometimes piecing all of this together. And ultimately what that comes down to is relationships. Here's what I mean by that. We tend to have a greater ability to trust when there is a relationship there for us to trust in. You know, if I, if I go to a brand new doctor and I ask that doctor what I'm supposed to do and I don't really have a lot of experience with that doctor, that's just, it, they're just new and they're supposed to know what they're talking about, it is a whole lot easier for me to argue and disagree with that doctor than it is somebody I've been seeing for 30 years and have never steered me wrong. Right? Because ultimately, trust is based on relationships more than it is anything else. And I think the same is true when it comes even to the relationship with God and whether we're going to choose we believe in God or not. A lot of time, that trust has to build through the experience of relationship over time. There are several examples as you go through Hebrews chapter 11. And Hebrews chapter 11 is a chapter on faith, Right? begins with the definition of faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. We know what faith is. And then it gives all of these examples of those who were, who were faithful. It says, for instance, that Abraham believed. Yeah, we know Abraham doubted. Here's what I mean by that. Turn with me over to Romans chapter 4. We'll come back to Hebrews 11 in a second. But Romans chapter 4, and there's this, these statements made about Abraham being the father of the faithful and the kind of man and the kind of decisions that he made. 
And it says here, after he says, God promised that he would make him the father of many nations. In the presence of God in whom he believed, the one who gives life to the dead and calls into existence things that do not exist. He believed, hoping against hope, so that he became the father of many nations. According to what had been spoken, so will your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body to be already dead since about a hundred years old. And also the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver in unbelief at God's promise, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God because he was fully convinced that what God has promised, he was able to do. Now, if you think back through the story of Genesis, do you remember the story of Abraham? Abraham's called by God out of his, out of his country, and if you'll go where I show you, I will give you these blessings, and Abraham does he gets up and goes he's probably about 70 years old at the time and he goes and travels to a foreign land he's been promised that he's going to have descendants but Sarah doesn't get pregnant and so eventually you have the story of him God and saying you know what I've chosen my chief servant as my heir he'll be the one to carry the promise and then God says nope that's not it that's not the right answer and so then they concoct this plan, Sarah primarily, of, you know what? Maybe you should take Hagar and have a child through Hagar because then maybe that will be what God wants you to do. And so Abraham agrees and, and Hagar becomes pregnant and gives birth to Ishmael. And God comes back and says, nope, nope, that wasn't it. As you go through, you don't have Abraham doubting that God's going to fulfill his promise, but you absolutely have Abraham sitting around wondering, how is this going to happen? My body's dead. Sarah's body's dead. How are we going to have this child? And then God comes before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and he reiterates, no, no, by this time next year, Sarah will have a child. Well, what's Sarah's reaction? Do y'all remember? Genesis chapter 18. I love Mia's like, I know. So she laughs, right? Like she laughs. She laughs and, and, and just how ridiculous this is. And then they go, why did she laugh? I didn't laugh. I, that wasn't me. I'm not laughing. Look with me back over in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 11 says, By faith even Sarah herself, when she was unable to have children, received power to conceive offspring, even though she was past the age since she was considered that the, since she considered that the one who had promised was faithful. Not initially. Initially she laughed. You get Joseph over in Genesis chapter 41, names his children that God has allowed me to forget the suffering of my people. He called Egypt the land of his affliction when he named his child. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 22 says that by faith Joseph, as he was nearing the end of his life, mentioned the exodus of the Israelite and gave instruction concerning his bones. He went from struggling to full belief. Moses was scared at times, but he still acted by faith. And here, here's the point I want you to see. Over and over and over again, as you go through Scripture, what you have are examples of people who, even in the difficult moments, even when they struggled with what was right versus what was wrong, even when they struggled with whether God was keeping his promises and how God was going to keep his promises, even when they didn't know exactly what was going to happen or how it was going to happen or what their role was in it, even when they were absolutely struggling with what to believe, they still trusted. They still acted by faith. Faith does not exclude moments of doubt. Faith works with moments of doubt. Because faith is what brings you over the hump of doubt back into obedience and trust. It's those in Hebrews 11 that were willing to move forward with, with obedience and trust even when they struggled with 
why or how or all the other things. Back in Matthew chapter 28, I find it interesting that the context there says there that the 11 disciples had gathered together. Remember that? Before Jesus ascended. The 11 disciples, they were in Galilee. When they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And you know the rest of the commission, right? Here's what I find interesting about that. Jesus didn't just give the great commission to those who were worshiping. He gave the great commission to those who were doubting. He gave it to both. Because doubt works with your faith. And we know from the stories that every single one of these 11 disciples took this great commission and did it, and did it well, and changed the world and turned the world upside down because they were willing to move forward despite their doubt. And I think we need to learn to do the same thing. That's what God's asking of us. God is not telling us that it is wrong and sinful to have doubt or to have question or to wonder or to to, to want to know more about what he's doing and what he expects you to do. God has no problem with all of that. The re, the, the time when God starts having trouble is when we've decided that our doubts are more important than our obedience. That our doubts can bring us to walk away from God. No. No. You obey God through the doubts and see where God takes you next. Because that's the way this often works. We, we end up having to just make a choice. I love the way 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says in verse 7, so we walk by faith and not by sight. Do you know what causes us most often to doubt? When we start using our eyes too much. When we start walking by sight instead of by faith. That, that's when we doubt. That's when we struggle. When we start trying to understand everything and everything has to be clear to me and I have to have an answer for every piece of this and now I can have no questions because if there's any questions whatsoever, then my faith isn't strong enough and I, I just need to walk away or there's not enough evidence or there's, there's not enough for me to go off of. No. No, that's what walking by faith is about. Walking by faith is doing what you know is right even when it doesn't make sense. And I love that 2 Corinthians chapter 5 continues on to talk about what this leads to is a stronger reconciled relationship. You want to be stronger in your faith? That comes through relationship. How do we get a better relationship with God? By being reconciled. How do we become reconciled? By trusting in him. How do you continue to grow in your trust? By having a better relationship. How do you have a better relationship? By being reconciled. I mean, it just, it, it's a nice, nice circle. Nice cycle. And I think that's really what James is getting to. One last passage for you here this morning. James chapter 1. Here it talks about the importance of not James chapter 1, and you look here in verse 8. We'll read verse 7 to get the whole sentence. The person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded and unstable in all his ways. And we read that and we go, okay, well that means we can't doubt. We can't ever have questions. But if you look over in chapter 4, Submit to God, it says in verse 7. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your heart, you double-minded. Be miserable, mourn, and weep, and let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and lift you up. What I want you to note about that is this. We often look at James chapter 1, verse 8, and we say, hey, there's no room for doubt in God's kingdom. (laughs) But then James chapter 4 says, some of us are double-minded. And what we just need to do is just keep 
moving forward. Keep moving forward. Realize that's part of it. Realize this is just part of what we're doing. You just got to keep moving forward. It's important that we recognize that. This is important to wrestle with for for two reasons. One is because I I think there are more of us Christians who struggle with doubt than we want to admit. And we, we guilt ourselves about it. I think we need to be careful about that. Doubt is part of the process of growing faith. Just don't let it stop you. But secondly, I think it's important because I I would imagine there are some who refuse to respond to the gospel call because of their doubt, because they don't have all the answers, because they they can't give a a clear reasoned answer for every detail. And so they they justify not responding to the gospel. They don't know everything yet. And I'm going to encourage you to stop that. And here's why. You will never have all the answers outside of Christ. I know that because you'll never have all the answers inside of Christ. That's kind of how this goes. You get enough answers, you come and you respond to your need for a Savior to get rid of your sins so that he might rescue you from yourself and rescue you from hell and rescue you from the danger you're in. And then as you grow in that relationship with God, you will continue to grow in your faith. I tell you, you will never have all the answers. And that's okay. Okay. Because that's what gives us reason to continue growing. If we can help you, if we can, if we can answer questions for you, maybe. Or maybe, maybe you have enough questions answered and you just need to respond. You just need to say, yes, I'm willing to commit and I'll find my answers later. If that's where you're at, we want to help you. We want to baptize you into Christ. If we can help you. Uh, we, uh, we invite you to come forward and let us know how we can as we stand and sing this song.